Hi everyone, I am reading Eagle of the Empire, The Relic Hunters, Book 1, by Martin Ferguson, presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1, Matt, The Highlands, Scotland. Run, run, get out of there, the headset screams in my ears as I dive through the waterfall. Soaking to the bone, I land hard on the rock of the cavern floor. The bite wound at my arm, searing in agony. Around me, the cave tremors. Staff lights crash down from the ceiling. I duck away from the cascade, rubble striking me, but I don't slow. Heart thundering in my chest as adrenaline and sheer will to escape forces me on. My predator leaps after me, jaws snapping wildly as it emerges from the water, fangs dripping crimson. I run on without pause, clutching at the deep bite to my arm, blood flowing through my fingers. Despite my agonizing wound, I have no choice but to carry the torch with that side. The torch is the only source of light in the cave. I feel the hot breath of the creature behind me, too close now to escape. I turn, slamming the flashlight across its skull, hoping that my surprise attack will be enough to give me an advantage. Howling in pain, the creature crashes into the wall behind me, blood drawn above an eye to stain the white and gray fur. Tremors ripple through the cave, and I take flight once more. Emerging into the widest cavern, flanked by the graves of the dead, I run for the entrance I used less than an hour before. In the distance, I see the great stone door begin to fall, threatening to trap me in this desolate place forever. Sprinting with all the strength and energy I have, I charge, arrows soaring from the walls and spears rising from the floor to stop me, punishment for disturbing sacred ground. I duck and dart away from the iron points which seek to tear my flesh. Many come close, too close, and my baseball cap flies from my head across the cavern, impaled on an arrow. No, no, no! I yell as the rock door continues to fall knowing I am not fast enough. The door hits the floor just as my fingers touch it, trapped. Slamming my fist uselessly on the stone, I swear loudly, my curses echoing throughout the dark cavern. There must be another way out, the voice on my headset cries frantically. Don't give up, look around you. There is no other way out, I mutter back in defeat, sweeping my torch back across the chamber. The light begins to flicker and dim, my torch failing as the batteries die. I'm slowly plunged into darkness, just as my vision is taken. I hear its clawed steps across the rock. Closer, closer, I can almost touch the menace. I'm not alone in here, I whisper. Terror seizes me. There is no escape. I have a terrible choice. Light a flare and give away both of our positions, or play guess in the dark. There isn't time to do, overthink it. From my pocket, I pull free a flare and ignite it. Red sparks burst from the tip, giving hellish light to the cavern. I hear the roar of the beast shaking the catacombs around me. I see it then, properly for the first time, demonic eyes glowing as it circles nearer. I struggle to control my fear. All I can do is breathe deep, readying myself for one last fight. I have no choice of surviving. Are you sure there's no way out? The voice in the headset pleads. There isn't, I say, resigned to my fate. The red eyes of the monster are curious. It's as if it's waiting to hear what my last words will be. Can you call Cat for me? Can you put me through to her? All I want is to hear her voice one last time, to tell her I love her. To tell her I will always be with her. To tell her I'm sorry. I've tried to contact Kat already, but she isn't picking up, the voice informs. I'm sorry, Hunter. Typical, I say, forcing a laugh. She never picks up the phone when it's important. Tell her for me, will you? Tell her I, tell her I struggle to find the words to say my goodbye. I'll tell her, the voice says, and I can hear the sadness and devastation. My final thoughts are of my family, my brother, my mother, and of course, Kat. I'm sorry, I whisper to them, knowing they will never hear my last words. The beastly roar grows deeper, louder, 
As the creature paces towards me, it is preparing for the kill. I will not fall without a fight. Come on, then, I urge, but it only roars again, as if playing some kind of game. Come on, I yell. A deep, menacing voice calls out to me from the shadows. It echoes throughout the chamber, giving it an unearthly quality. You are right, my friend. You are not alone. Who are you? I am answered by the sudden flare of blue flames at the center of the chamber. They grow with astonishing speed, rising high and filling the cavern surrounding me. You are not alone, the voice states. You are never alone. The flames grow closer as if reaching for me. Their heat licks my skin. There is nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I sense it, your past, your tragedy. The blue flames surge towards me, engulfing me. All defined senses are lost as I scream in sheer agony. Hunter! The voice in my headset cries, Hunter! Adam, Richmond, London, England. My classmates are cheering me. Hunter, Hunter, Hunter! As I pull myself up from the windows to the drain pipe and then to the top of the building. Standing on the rooftop of the college, grin broad across my face, I raise a finger to my lips to hush the small crowd on the playing field. They don't stop. Their cheers grow until I give up my protest and lift my arms high in triumph. My name is Adam Hunter, and I am a failing student at the Ket Sixth Form College, dreaming of a life beyond textbooks and classrooms. Sixteen years old, a week shy of my seventeenth birthday, and always daydreaming of escape and freedom. Handsome, with a perfect athletic build and a dazzling smile with dark, spiked hair and blue eyes. That's me. Modest, too. Careless, reckless, always distracted. Those are just some of the words used to describe me. And to be fair, they're probably spot on. I stand and salute my adoring fans one last time before backing away from the edge. The smile is still at my lips, but I can't help it. The challenge has begun. I am wearing the usual jeans ripped at the knees, a red hoodie, faded gray leather biker jacket, and old trainers, muddy and faded with use. I cross the roof, vaulting over all obstacles, and then leap to the next building, unhindered by the effort needed, and fearless of the gap, height, and potential fall, and probably death. My friends call it parkour, or free running, but I simply see it as making the world my own private playground. I drop out of sight as I see teachers pass the windows opposite to where I prowl the rooftops, lingering for a few seconds before rising again. The way is clear and my presence unnoticed. Get the prize and get out, I say to myself, pulling the hood over my head, concealing part of my face in case of discovery or being captured by the CCTV cameras. No worries. One more time, I cross to another rooftop before nearing a skylight. Popping its lock open with my trusty penknife, my father's gift from long ago. I wait and listen for signs of discovery, but no alarm is raised. Opening the skylight as wide as it'll go, I squeeze through and drop to the classroom below. As I fall, my jacket catches on a chair and sends it tumbling towards the floor. My reflexes are, thankfully, quick enough. Catching the chair before it can crash to the ground and betray my location. <clears throat> No worries, I whisper to myself in relief. Carefully, quietly, I put the chair down, but I hear an approaching voice from outside coming closer. Quickly, I duck down behind a desk as a teacher walks past the room. She speaks loudly on her mobile phone, complaining relentlessly about her terrible students and our misdeeds. I know the voice all too well. It belongs to Miss Rhodes, known as Spike, to her pupils. Peering through the window, I see her, a tall woman, big, dolled up gray hair, and a damning stare that would terrify most. Not me, though. I just find it funny and struggle not to break down in laughter each time she yells at me. Her hair is nearly all gone, but for one solitary lock that won't settle, no matter how much she tries to brush it down. Unsurprisingly, she hates the name. And the hunter boy, he's getting worse by the day. Nothing like his brother before him. They're the sons of a teacher, did you know? Who would have thought he'd turn out like this? Mind, they're often the worst. My mother certainly knew despite our best efforts, she is glad she never had to teach us, especially me. 
Not only did he unscrew every nut and bolt in my chair so that it collapsed when I sat down today, she continues, but I am certain it was him who broke into my cabinet, stole my test papers, and replaced those I was to hand out today with the answer copy. Unsurprisingly, they all scored a hundred percent. I struggle not to laugh until Miss Rhodes passes on. Yeah, it was me, I whisper once out of earshot. Grinning still, another bout of detention on its way, I guess. Moving to the doorway of the classroom, I crouch down, looking down the deserted corridor. My mobile phone buzzes twice in my pocket, and making sure no one is approaching, I quickly look to its screen. Two messages showing. Hurry up, Duncan. You're running out of time. Sarah. Nothing like pressure, I say, returning the phone to my pocket. Checking the corridor one last time, I set out, running quickly and silently. I stop a few times listening for approaching footsteps and peer into classrooms. But just as I am nearing my destination, I see the door before me swing open. Spike emerges. She's still ranting on the phone. I dive towards the nearest set of lockers, pulling myself up and atop them, out of sight. I try not to move. The lockers creak under my weight. And he messed around with the presentation for my 10 o'clock science class instead of the different categories of rocks. There were pictures of me on my beach holiday. I've never been so embarrassed and sickened in all my... Neither have we, I think, struggling not to laugh. She disappears around the corner, her, tir her tirade unending. My phone buzzes with another text message. Come on, Hunter, hurry up. Everybody's waiting, Duncan. Before I can put the phone away, it vibrates again. Another message received. I'm guessing you don't want your motorcycle keys back then. I wonder how much I can sell the bike for. Sarah. Lowering down from the lockers, I move quickly along the corridor, nearing Mr. Beckett's classroom, my target. The man stands before the entrance, talking with another teacher I have not seen before. Mr. Beckett's untidy beard and creased clothes add to his tired, miserable appearance. He has a stern look on his face as always. Wait here while I grab my ladder, he tells the other teacher. Mr. Beckett raises his staff badge to the door handle, a fob activating the lock. The only way inside as I wait. I pull a fresh green apple from my pocket. Mr. Beckett takes no time at all, merging quickly from within, lighter in hand. Once the two teachers begin to walk away, I roll the apple across the floor, wedging the door open just as it's about to close. I smile with satisfaction. Running forward, I silently enter the room, heading straight over to Mr. Beckett's desk. I produce a set of keys from my pocket. A keychain image of Mr. Beckett and his wife and children, and the teacher's car keys are attached. Next time you confiscate someone's football, keep a better eye on the keys in your jacket pocket, I murmur before unlocking the desk drawer. I could have picked the lock on the desk easily enough, a skill my brother taught me years ago. But it was much more challenging and fun to borrow them from Mr. Beckett as he buried in me. Always the extra challenge. Inside the desk drawers are mobile phones, iPads, and a dozen other confiscated items from my classmates. In the deepest drawer at the bottom is a football, Duncan's football, but there is also one more item of note, one that I can't forget. A silver chain with a rose pendant. Hurrying, not knowing how much time I have left, I return all the items to the desk of their owners until I hear the door handle turn. Just gotta get my keys, Mr. Beckett calls as he enters the classroom. Ducking beneath the tables and desk, I run unseen, sliding through the now ajar doorway and leaping through the open window on the far side of the corridor. I fall amongst bushes, tumbling through the foliage, with branches whipping my body and face until I hit the ground. Rolling as I land, the impact is still enough to drive the air from my lungs. Coughing and gasping for air, I stagger up and jog on, football still in my arms. I head toward this playing field, but I am brought to a sudden stop as three figures emerge before me. I know them. Guys from my class. Thick, stupid, always eager to fight and steal. This is far from our first run-in. I have no idea why they are still in college. Their grades are as bad as their stench. There has been a rivalry between their leader, Shane, and I for years. It's been going on since way back to primary school. I can't even remember how it all began, probably over a girl. Hey, Hunter, Shane, the tallest and broadest of them, says. I was hoping we'd run into you. Time we had a little chat. What you got there for us? 
tracking his eyes as he is, he is looking at the thread of necklace looping out of my pocket. In the sunlight, it is shining brightly. 